Hello, we are here for a final review of all chapters, everything that we have covered so far. We are going to review it and then it will help you hopefully for your final exam. So we started with chapter 1, Introduction to Fluid Mechanics. It's just a simple chapter about some basic definitions of fluid mechanics and then all about what is fluid mechanics. So we have three states of matter, solids, liquids and gases. So we have, we have another class which is known as mechanics of solid or solid mechanics and then you have liquids and gases. Well, what is fluid? Anything that flows is a fluid. So liquids and gases are fluid and therefore this is fluid mechanics is nothing but mechanics of liquids and gases. So fluid mechanics, mechanics of liquids and gases classified into two parts, fluid statics, study of fluids at rest and fluid dynamics, study of fluids in motion. In the chapter 1 we learn under we learn importance of unit system. We have two different unit system, one is British unit system and that is foot pound system and that is SI unit system that is meter kilogram system. The rule here is that whatever unit system you choose, make sure that for your entire problem you are on the same page, you are use same units. If you use one unit from one system, another unit from another system, it won't work. So make sure that you understand, not just in fluid mechanics, but any uh, other class in the future, any time you work professionally, make sure that you follow, you are consistent with your, your units. Then we learn some basic definitions, density and specific volume. Density is mass per unit volume. It's a unit is kilogram per meter cube. And specific volume given by letter V is exactly opposite of density, it's volume per unit mass. The unit is meter cube per kilogram. Then we learn about specific weight and specific gravity. So specific weight is nothing but weight per unit volume. Amount of weight you have per unit volume, the unit is Newton per meter cube. And specific gravity is the ratio of density of fluid or ratio of density of a substance to the ratio of density of a standard substance. Normally it is a water. So specific gravity is density of standard substance by density of water and as density density both are same things they cancel the unit cancel each other out and then specific gravity does not have unit. The importance of specific gravity is that it tells you how heavier or how lighter is your fluid is. For example specific gravity of oil is 0.8, pound 8 is less than 1 so if it is less than 1 we know that oil is lighter than water. Specific gravity of mercury is 13.6, so 13.6 is far greater than 1 and therefore we know that mercury is 13 times heavier than water. So this number is less than 1, the specific gravity is less than 1, it is lighter than water, if it is more than 1 it is heavier than water. That's a simple understanding of specific gravity and it does not have unit, it's just a number. Then we learn about viscosity. So viscosity is nothing but thickness of a fluid, how thick your fluid is. For example, oil is thicker than water, so oil has high viscosity, it is going to take more time. Low viscosity, water has low viscosity, it is going to take less time for fill up this jar. So that's your viscosity, internal resistance of a fluid. Then we learn about the effects of temperature on the viscosity. So if you are dealing with liquids, let's say oil, with temperature viscosity decreases. So if you have high viscous oil and then if you increase the temperature, if you heat up the oil or it will become more fluid, the viscosity will decrease. In case of gases, it's slightly opposite. What happens with gases is that in case if you are trying to heat up the gas, the viscosity of gas is actually increases. There is not whole lot of increase but there is slight increase. So keep that in mind. That's a different from liquids to gases. So liquids decrease with viscosity decreases with temperature with gases it increases with temperature and then when you deal with viscosity there are two kinds of viscosity if you go back and the book it's both are same thing more or less so the absolute viscosity is dynamic viscosity given by letter mu this is the viscosity that you use most of the time si unit for this viscosity is newton second per meter square or kg by meter second and this is the major viscosity that you have to deal with. Every time you see the symbol mu, that is your dynamic viscosity or absolute viscosity. That is the real viscosity. Then sometimes this viscosity and density are associated with each other. So what happens is that if I 
divide this dynamic viscosity, absolute viscosity with density, then that becomes kinematic viscosity. So kinematic viscosity is nothing but this is absolute viscosity divided by the density at that given temperature, nothing but kinematic viscosity given by the symbol nu. This nu is some look something like V, but keep that in mind. It's a nu or another way to draw it nu is like this one. So this is nu. There is a difference in unit for dynamic and kinematic. Of course, you are going to divide it by density for kinematic, so the unit will be different here. So, dynamic viscosity, the unit in Newton second per meter square. Kinematic viscosity is simply a meter square per second. That's the unit for kinematic viscosity because you divide it by density. So, keep that in mind. Every time you see mu, that is your absolute viscosity. For example, Reynolds number is rho Vd by mu. This mu is absolute viscosity and dynamic viscosity. That's what you are supposed to use. Sometimes you may have to use kinematic viscosity, but it has different symbols. So if you are confused, what viscosity we have to use? Uh, pay attention to the units. Dynamic viscosity mu uh, has different unit. It is like this one, Newton second per meter square or some other units here. Kinematic viscosity has a different unit, so keep that in mind. Most of the time you have to use dynamic viscosity. There are very few times you may have to use kinematic viscosity. So keep that in mind and then some other commonly used quantities, their units, their basic dimensions are given. So it should be there in your blackboard in some of the slides. That's what we learn some basic definitions, basic understanding in chapter 1. That's introduction to fluid mechanics. Chapter 2 is fluid statics. If this is statics means study of fluids at rest. So in chapter 2 we start with pressure in a fluid. So let's say we have a large tank and then we want to know what is pressure in the fluid at the bottom of this tank. So the bottom of this tank to understand the pressure we take a water column, an imaginary water column and then here we try to understand the pressure at, this, at the base of this water column. So pressure is nothing but force upon area. Force is nothing but mass and gravity the mass of the water column and act gravity acted on it. So mg is nothing but force and area is ab and then I work my way through and then I'll get pressure at the bottom of the fluid is density gravity into height. So rho gh and that's the simple understanding of pressure at the bottom of the fluid. That's what I get. So here density is constant, gravity is constant. Only thing that could change is height. So what it does it tell me that this pressure at the bottom does not depend on the how much width or quantity of water. All it depends on the height. More the height, more the pressure. Less the height, less the pressure. So keep that in mind. So it is only and only depend on height. That's pressure is nothing but density, gravity into height. Very basic, very important understanding about fluid statics. Then we learn about Pascal's principle. Blaise Pascal was the guy some two, three hundred years ago. He said that if you have uncompressible fluid, it's oil or water in liquid state. If you have incompressible fluid and if you put it in a confined space that confined everything is closed, then there's this pressure at this point, at this point, at this point, at this point is going to stay same. It means that pressure at P1 and P2 are exactly the same and we can use that this principle for hydraulic jack or hydraulic pump. So here you can apply some very small amount of force and then you can raise this two or three thousand pound car and that's the importance of Pascal principle. It makes our lives easier. Then we learn about barometer or measurement of pressure, in this case atmospheric pressure. So barometer is simple device, we turn it upside down, we fill it with mercury, this test tube or uh, glass tube, we fill it with mercury, we turn it upside down in a tank and then mercury level will slightly go down and you will see the height and that will be equal, equivalent to atmospheric pressure. The reason is that on this side and this side the atmosphere is acting on this mercury. If you do this experiment in volume, this level will continue to go down and then you will get entire vacuum because you are doing experiment in vacuum. If it is atmospheric pressure, whatever the atmospheric pressure you are going to get this height. It's a very simple but very important device to measure atmospheric pressure. Then we learn about manometer, very useful device to measure pressure difference and then to calculate flow rate. So here what happens is that for manometer, this is a manometer, this is kind of a device we have here. We have high pressure fluid coming in because of the velocity increases in this nozzle section. The pressure will decrease. So high pressure here is going to push down on the mercury. Low pressure here is going to get up and then you will get this pressure difference, height difference here. You measure the height difference. You can measure the pressure difference. You have pressure difference. You can calculate velocity. You can calculate flow rate altogether. Here, if the pressure is same, you are going to get same level. 
If the pressure is one side higher, you are going to get down, and then lower pressure will go up. If you create a vacuum at one side, low pressure will be created here, so relative high pressure will be higher here, it's going to go down, then you will get this pressure difference. That's the simple idea of manometer, it's very simple. Then we learn the problems for multi-fluid manometer. Multi-fluid manometer means that what we have is normally we have two tanks or two sections. One is tank, another is connected to atmosphere or one tank and another tank. And then in between there is a long tube and then in that tube we have a whole lot of fluids put in. It. So we have here uh, for this problem from the book, we have a water initially, then we have oil and then we have mercury. So we have three different kinds of fluids. And in this problem, in particular, what happens is that pressure at one side is given or it is atmospheric pressure and then you have to find the pressure at another side. So that's the basic idea about this problem. So what you have to do for this kind of problem, let's say for this problem, what we have to do in this here is that pressure at point 2 is given its atmospheric pressure. So we know pressure at point 2. We want to find out pressure at point 1. It is a closed tank and then we want to know what is the pressure at here at point 1. So this kind of problem we pick a side, we either go from 1 to 2 or 2 to 1 and then we try to understand, we try to create the equation like this. So let's assume that we start with point 2. Now what I'm going to do is that at point 2, P2, I'm going to write down P2 like this. P2 is atmospheric pressure, so for now I'm going to write down P2. Then I'll see what fluid I have. I have mercury. Mercury starts here, starts here and ends here. So what I see is mercury is ending downwards with height h3 okay so mercury ending downwards so in this problem downward is always positive because rho g h pressure downward is positive so downward is always positive so here i'm going to say that mercury starts here mercury and downwards so i'm going to apply my positive sign here and then i'll say density of mercury g h3 that's it you learn rho g h that's rho g h density of mercury gravity h3 down then <coughs> what happens you start here uh, you have the you have mercury ends here and now oil begins so oil goes up here and then it ends up here so it's ending height h2 upward direction so downward positive upward negative and that's oil ending upward so upward positive upward negative i'm going to apply negative sign and then density of oil g h2 because density rho g h density gravity height h2 in upward direction so that's minus sign and then that's my h2 oil ends here done now water begins here and water ends here so again water is ending upward direction with height h1 so i'm going to say upward direction minus rho g h density of water g h1 upward and once i reach at point one all you have to do is simply put equal to sign is equal to point 0.1, P1. And that's the equation. You solve the equation and then you will get the answer pressure at point P1. There is another way to do it. You can go from 1 to 2. P1, you start with P1. P1, then oil starts here, oil ends here. Oil is ending downward in H1 direction. So I'm going to apply positive signs plus density G H1. Then plus... Now here I can see that oil starts here and ends here. Oil is ending downward direction. So I am going to put that H2 height there and then I am going to write down density gravity height downward positive positive density gravity height rho g h for oil and that's it. Then I see here that oil mercury starts here and ends upward at P2. Okay. So upward negative minus density rho g h upward direction is equal to p2 so once i reach at the final point apply equal to sign get p2 and that's it both equations are same thing all you have to do now is solve these equations get down so you will know what is the pressure at this point it's very simple all you have to do is that pick a point go upward and downward positive or negative based on that apply the equation get your equations once you get the equation all you have to do is punch in numbers and then it becomes very easy. So that's your problem for multi-fluid manometer. Let's move on to the final part for this chapter is Archimedes principle. So Archimedes is the guy who said that every time you have an object in the fluid, there is a buoyant force acted in opposite of gravity in upward direction 
and that go and force is equal to weight of the fluid displaced. It means that what happens is that if I this tank is full and then if I insert this object and now the water will come out if I measure the weight of that water that weight of the water is equal to the buoyant force applied on this mass. So keep that in mind. Buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. It is not the weight of the object. It is the weight of the fluid displaced. So at this point I am standing here. There is a buoyant force form. Air is applied on my body. But the problem is that air I am displacing, the weight of the air that I am displacing is very limited. Is very low and therefore that buoyant force from the air is negligible. So weight of the fluid displaced, keep that in mind. But if I go in the water, the weight of the weight of the water displaced because of my body will be higher, and therefore, if I know swimming, I will I will float on the water. Anyways, so that was chapter two, fluid statics. Then we learn fluid dynamics, the Bernoulli's equation, the most important chapter, fluid mechanics. Fluid statics we learn in chapter 2, the study of fluids at rest. Fluid dynamics is vast. So fluid dynamics we learn first in chapter 3, Bernoulli's equation. And then we learn flow analysis in chapter 8 and chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, we learn open channel flow. And then later in your final year, if you take the elective course CFD computational fluid dynamics, you will learn with about these Navier-Stokes equation. So that's your fluid dynamics. It's classified into two parts, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics study of air or other gases in motion study of water and other liquids in motion, that's your hydrodynamics. It starts with the most important thing, uh, most important equation given by this guy Daniel Bernoulli is this one. So this is the equation is simply a conservation of energy. So you have some energy here and at any given moment the energy will stay constant and that's the general idea. So sum of all that energy, pressure energy, kinetic energy, potential energy at this point is equal to sum of pressure energy, potential energy, kinetic energy at this point, at this point and at this point. Everywhere it's going to stay same and that's your equation that's called Bernoulli equation, very important. Bernoulli equation, we have to assume some few basic things to make this equation work. What are these basic things? Viscous effects are negligible. It means that there is absolutely no viscosity, there is no friction. That's what we assume to make it work in its perfect form. Then flow is steady, then flow is incompressible and flow is along the streamline. So there is no acceleration in the fluid. There is no density change in the fluid, you cannot compress it and then flow is around the nice and streamlined, there is no turbulence in the fluid, there is no rotational currents in the fluid. If these conditions are satisfied, if things are super perfect, then this equation will work in its perfect form, otherwise you have to modify this equation. So this is a basic very good equation, it works under ideal conditions. We learned this, we played this game in the class, if you have attended the class, so in this kind of game, it is very good way to understand what happens with Bernoulli's equation. So here in this equation, what we have to do is that we have to go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 and then we have to figure out what will happen with the pressure, what will happen with the uh, height and what will happen with the velocity. So here point 1 to 2, you go, pressure will decrease, height increases, velocity stays constant from 2 to 3. Here we have pressure increases, velocity decreases because the area of cross section increases and then the height stays constant and so on and so forth. So you have to figure out how this equation works and then you will get some sense what is this Bernoulli's equation is all about. This is very important equation, please do not forget this equation, all right? Whatever happens in fluid mechanics, you are allowed to forget some smaller things, but this is the very basic part, Bernoulli's equation, don't forget it, it's very important. Then we learn application of Bernoulli equation for a siphon or process of siphon. So siphon is basically, we have two tanks, one is tank is at higher elevation, one other tank it has lower elevation and then the water will flow from high tank to low tank because the low pressure is created in this section so it's going to suck some water here and then it's going to transfer to, to the lower tank and that's what happens in the process of siphon. Now for this application of siphon we did application of Bernoulli's equation to siphon, we did this kind of a problem, this is from a book. So what has happened in this problem is that we have a large tank here and then that tank is transferring water somewhere here. Now, what we want to do, is, what we want to find out is what is this maximum height. So in general, we are going to get low pressure here and then because of that water is going to get sucked in and then it's go at point 0.3. There is a limit how high you can go because the higher and higher you go, higher and higher this height increase, the pressure drops a lot here. 
and there is a point where pressure drops below vapor pressure it means that as it goes below vapor pressure steam bubbles are formed the process is known as cavitation and if there is a cavitation density of steam is different than water you are not going to have flow of water afterwards so we want to know what is the maximum possible height without cavitation that flow will continue that just at the point where you will begin the cavitation so it means that at pressure at point 2 should be equal to vapor pressure of the water at 15 degrees celsius that's 1710 pascal it means what it is that find the height at 1710 pascal pressure if it is 1610 if it is goes down then cavitation will be there so how go higher it go pressure will go down cavitation will be there so at that pressure 1710 pascal i want to know what is the pressure so i can calculate here at uh, so i can calculate this maximum height So here we are going to apply Bernoulli's equation from point two to point three. So the way you that is that you start here at point two and point three. Apply the equation like this one. So pressure at point two is at most uh, the pressure condition is seventeen ten pascal. I'm going to put that seventeen ten pascal here. The velocity at point two and point three are exactly the same. And the reason is that they are same is that is the same area of the, the tube has the same area of cross section. So I'm going to cancel that V2. I'm going to cancel that V3. Then height Z2 I have to calculate. So this is my Z2 from the datum I want to know. P3 is the atmospheric pressure here. I'm going to put that atmospheric pressure there. And then this Z3 is 1.5 below datum. So I'm going to apply minus sign. So minus 1.5. I'm going to put that. I'm going to solve my equation. And once you solve this equation. Will get 8.65 meter height. Now, when you study for this kind of problem, do not read the problem. Make sure that you take pen and paper and you solve these problems. Okay? Don't read the problem. If you read the problem, you are going to make silly mistakes in the test. So, whatever happens, do not read the problem. Solve this problem. Take pen and paper. Understand the concept. Solve the problem. So, height you get 8.65 meters. What does it mean? It means that if I go beyond 8.65, 8.7, 8.8, 9 meters, if I go that, if I change, if I take this tube upper higher and higher, the pressure will go below 1710. It will go 1600, 1500, 1400, and as soon as it goes below 1700, the cavitation will form, formation of vapor bubbles. The vapor bubbles will form, the flow will stop. So that's the maximum height. If I stay below this height, four, five, six meters, you don't have to worry about it. The flow will continue, and that's pretty much we have. application of bernoulli's equation to solve then we learn about static stagnation dynamic pressure so if i dissect this basic equation into three parts static pressure hydrostatic pressure and dynamic pressure so this one is static hydrostatic dynamic and then collectively what i'll get is total pressure so sometimes if you are designing horizontal machine like a steam turbine as it is horizontal the inlet and outlet hydrostatic pressure is going to stay same because height is same so i'm going to cancel this out and then i'm left with p plus this one that's summation of static dynamic pressure so combination of these two pressure static and dynamic pressure is known as stagnation pressure p dot tube is a device which uses the stagnation pressure and then we switch you can calculate velocity so keep that in mind and then do the problem for the p dot tube it's important so that's your stagnation pressure then we learn about flow rate measurement devices so how the bernoulli's equation helps us to find out a flow rate measurement because if you are dealing in industry so a lot of pipes in a company in that case there you need to know what is exact efficient what is exact flow rate what is velocity in those pipes and then you can use this kind of devices to measure flow rate and velocity that's based on bernoulli's equation so how these devices work simple obstruction meter we have some kind of obstruction so here you have high pressure after obstruction low pressure you calculate that pressure difference you put that pressure difference in the equation you can calculate flow rate where this equation come from this is my bernoulli's equation for horizontal device i am going to cancel height and this is my bernoulli's equation i am going to combine it with this continuity equation q is equal to a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 if i combine this one if i play around i will get this equation all i need is to measure pressure difference p1 minus p2 p1 p2 here p1 p2 here p1 p2 here you measure the difference you can calculate flow rate orifice meter are very cheap but less accurate devices because losses are high venturi meter are very accurate but very expensive 
So that's the way. If you have a whole lot of budget, use the insulin meter. If you don't have much budget, use nozzle meter or orifice meter, and then you can figure out how much flow rate you are going to have in your uh, pipe. Then we learn about energy line, hydraulic grade line. What is energy line on hydraulic grade line? With perfect form of Bernoulli's equation, we know that it's conservation of energy. Energy stays constant at this point, at this point, at this point, it's going to stay constant. So I'm going to draw this energy line, and then that tells me that constant thing, the constant head altogether. So total head from the datum is going to stay constant. That's nothing but my energy line, or graphical representation of Bernoulli's equation. Then there is another line known as hydraulic grade line. Hydraulic grade line is sum of static pressure and your hydrostatic pressure, that is your elevation. So overall, in this problem, overall as pro progresses, the hydraulic grade line decreases like this, but energy line stays constant, and then that gives you a general idea of what's happening with the flow. In general, if I don't know the figure or geometry, if I know these two lines, I can I can predict overall what's happening with the flow. So that's your graphical representation for Bernoulli's equation. And then finally, we learn about restrictions or limitations on Bernoulli's equation. What are these limitations? Those assumptions that we learned before, you do exactly opposite of those assumptions, those become limitations. Viscous effects. If there is high friction, high viscosity, you have to modify the equation. You have to add your head losses in it. Viscous effects. Unsteady flow. If there is uh, Acceleration, if the flow is unsteady, then you have to modify the equation dv by dt, you have to use acceleration here. Compressibility effects and rotational effects. So here, if you have a large change in densities, if it is compressible, then you have to modify the equation. This is the original form of equation you have to modify. And then rotational effects, if you are going to have rotational currents, if you are going to have hydraulic jump, whole lot of turbulence, again, you have to modify the equation. So these are the limitations for the original form of Bernoulli's equation. Or Bernoulli's equation is perfect equation but works under perfect conditions. Life is not so perfect. There will be some issues and then as you have, if you want to deal with these issues, if you want to deal with viscosity, compressibility, rotational effect, unsteadiness, you have to modify your perfect equation. And that's how we can make it work for practical purpose. And that's what we did in chapter 3. Then in chapter 7 we learned dimensional analysis, and similitude and modeling. So you have an idea of a plane or a car or a ship you have a new design, but you can't build a design directly. You have to test it. To test it, what you do is you build a small model, and then you take it in a wind tunnel or water tunnel, and you test it. The science to test these things from uh, how to what, what should be the dimension, what should be the velocities, how to scale up or scale down your results. All that science is known as dimensional analysis, and that's what you learn in this chapter. So dimensional analysis, the first part of dimensional analysis is this Buckingham pi theorem. In this part, we have to find out dimensionless terms known as pi terms. And that's the basic idea for this chapter. You get these pi terms and then you can post-process them for further analysis. So first part, it says that use these eight steps and if you have did these problems, use these eight steps and find out how, uh, use these eight steps and then find out that what are these pi terms. So here you start with list all the variables, all the problems and then determine the required number of pi terms, all that you process follow, then you find out the values of A, B, and C. And then, once you find out A, B, and C, you make that combination dimensionless, and then finally you can write down your results. Pi 1 is a function of pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, so on and so forth. That's the first part of the problem. Then in the second part, we learn to use it, how to use it. Uh, so this kind of problem we did in the class. So here, this is a component of a bridge. I can't build a bridge, I can't test a component. So I built a smaller component, test it in what tunnel, and I try to understand, try to predict how this make main component will behave. So we start with a step one for Buckingham Pi theorem, list all the variables, we make our step two, step three, so on and so forth, and then step eight, we'll get three pi terms, pi one, pi two, and pi three. Now, our objective is to find out, we predict how the main component will behave. So for that, first we need dimensions. So we use this one to calculate dimensions. Once we have dimensions, we build the object, we put it into water tunnel. Now, you need to know what velocity you should run. You can use this term, you can calculate velocity, then you run your experiment. Once you run your experiment, it says that you are going to get frequencies 49.9 Hz in your experiment. So what is that frequency is equivalent to original object? And then you can, for that, you can use this term and then figure and then predict how much exactly the number with original object. So you get your dimensions here. Once you have your dimensions, you get your velocity, you run your experiment, 
and then finally you will get omega as 29 hertz it means that this object original object now will have 29 hertz frequency here it means that what it did it told you you predicted how this component will behave without building a component and that's the whole idea of dimensional analysis or doing this process then in this chapter we learn the dimensionless groups those repeat themselves if you are dealing with the same experiments for example this kind of experiments this rho v d pi mu this kind of thing it's going to repeat so it's called a reynolds number given by us von reynolds then some other numbers a fluid number if you are dealing with open channel flow this dimensionless entity will repeat itself power of the pi terms Euler number, Cauchy number. If you are dealing with pressure difference, Euler number is important. If you are dealing with compressibility of the fluid, Cauchy number is important. Then, if you are dealing with very high speeds, greater than speed of sound, in that case, you will get the Mach number or Mach number as one of your dimensionless term, and that, and that's pretty much it. So, this is your common dimensionless group in your fluid mechanics, and that's what we learn in chapter seven. Then in chapter eight we started with viscous flow in pipes. So now the viscous term added because your original equation is not perfect. Original Bernoulli's equation is not perfect. So we have to consider this viscosity, and that's why the title of this chapter is viscous flow in pipes. So we have two kinds of flows. We have pipe flow, and then we have open channel flow. In pipe flow, what happens? You start with high pressure, and because of the friction, because of the viscosity, you're going to lose some pressure. You're going to end up with lower pressure. That's your viscous flow in pipes. And then open channel flow, chapter 10, later we learn that the total flow is constant here. Uh, total pressure at point 1 and point 2 is constant and that's your open channel flow. Because of the gravity, this open channel flow is there. For in this chapter 8, we learn about this viscous flow in pipes. This chapter starts with the work of Osborne Reynolds. Osborne Reynolds is the guy, he said that in 1883, that if the, if the Reynolds number rho Vd by mu is less than 2100, call it a laminar flow, if it is more than 4000, call it a turbulent flow and it will look something like this here. You have nice laminar flow here and then turbulence here and that's how you can classify the flow. And so far 140 years later we still use this classification because it works very well. So that's your Reynolds number. Then we did this experiment. So what it says that with effect of temperature and Reynolds number. So what it says that uh, if you have lower temperatures, if the same Reynolds number then it takes less time to fill up this glass. If it is higher temperature is going to take more time to fill up this glass for the same Reynolds number. So that's what the experiment is all about. Then we learn about entrance region length. So because of the friction, as soon as this fluid enters in the pile, because of the friction, the velocity profile will begin to change. Initially you have velocity, it's entering at all the sides with the same velocity. But now as it flow progresses, you are going to get some friction here, some friction here, and it's going to go along, and then you're going to end up this kind of a bulge at this uh, in the in the tube. So what's going to happen is that this length, you have developing flow and fully developed flow is known as entrance region length. And we want to know how much this entrance region length is and that is the function of Reynolds number. If Reynolds number is very low, it's laminar flow, calculate, use this formula to calculate Reynolds number. If Reynolds number is very high, if it is a turbulent flow, in that case use this formula and calculate entrance region length. It's very simple. Then, most important part in this chapter is about head loss. So, we know that this is a perfect equation valid under perfect conditions. So, what to do if we have a whole lot of losses, if we have a whole lot of friction in them? And then we balance this equation by using this head loss. So, head loss is a combination of major loss and minor loss due to friction. We have major loss due to pipe fittings and bends. We have minor loss. So, that's together, all together we have a head loss and we want to know what is this head loss? And to understand that, we try to understand the pressure drop across the pipe. So, you start with high pressure here at one pipe end, then you end up with very low pressure at another pipe end. And now, I want to know what is the change in pressure. And if I can calculate change in pressure, I should be able to calculate head loss. How much head I am losing for given pressure drop. So, to do that, we start with Buckingham Pi analysis. We have our Step 1, write down all the variables for pressure drop, then step 8, get pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4. Get that? And then our objective is to calculate pressure drop and head loss. So here, I'm going to work my way through. I'm going to get my friction factor as combination of Reynolds number and relative roughness epsilon by d. I'm going to club that together. I'm going to get delta P F L by d rho V square by 2. 
and then that's my change in pressure. If I use this equation, I can get pressure drop. Then I can use that pressure drop to calculate HL major. So I apply my Bernoulli's equation, I will write down that delta P and I will replace this equation entire, put that for the delta P and then I'll get your HL major. That's HL major to also head loss from due to friction is FL by D V square by 2G. And then for that F here, I use Moody chart. So here epsilon by D, Reynolds number, Reynolds number draw a vertical, epsilon by D follow a black line, drop a point, draw a horizontal, get a friction factor. If you still don't know how to use this Moody chart, there is a video how to use Moody chart already on Blackboard. Go and watch that video and then you will learn more about Moody chart. It's very simple. Once you have Moody chart, once you have friction factor, you can easily put the friction factor here, which is the friction factor here, and you can solve the problem. And that's pretty much general idea about how to use this chart. Then we learn about minor loss. Minor loss is happens because this pi of fitting spins and walls. So you have this change in kinetic energy because of these thing obstructions, you are going to lose some kinetic energy and because of that loss in, losses in kinetic energy, uh, you are going to lose some pressure and that will be pressure drop due to minor loss. If you are using just one bend or one wall, you don't have to worry much about minor loss. But if you are using multiple walls and multiple bends, then minor losses add up. And then you have to calculate that. You have to make sure that your system is designed for those losses. So to understand this pressure drop and minor, uh, HL minor, we have this kind of formula, KL delta P. Now the way we have friction factor for major loss, we have KL loss coefficient for minor loss. Value for KL is directly given in the table. You use this table and then you can calculate the value for KL. So this is the table that is in your book, you can use that, you can get the KL, if not, then KL is normally given in the problem, use that KL, find out your HL minor and pressure drop. Then finally, we learn about multiple pipe system. If the pipes are arranged are in parallel or in series, if it is in series, add your head losses, head loss here, 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 they are same. If they are in parallel, head losses are equal, head loss one, head loss two, head loss three are exactly the same. HL one is equal to HL two is equal to HL three. That's it. Keep that in mind how to work, make it work for series flow and parallel flow and then you can use this understanding to solve the problems for multiple pipe systems. And then finally, if you are dealing with multiple inlets and multiple outlets, in that case, you can simply use computational fluid dynamics. If problems is too complex, you will learn, you, can, you, you provide it to the computer and the computer can calculate for you. That's CFT computational fluid dynamics. In your final year, you can take this elective to understand more about computational fluid dynamics. That's what we did in chapter 8 and then chapter 9 flow over inverse bodies. In this chapter, two major things that we learn is that lift force and the drag force. So every time any body is inside the fluid and fluid is moving over a body or body is moving through the fluid, either way, you're going to have two forces, lift force and drag force acted by the fluid on the body. So, the lift force is normally perpendicular to the direction of the fluid, in this case it's upward direction, and that is due to pressure on the body. And then there is a drag force, is a shear stress, it is in direction of the fluid, parallel to the direction of the fluid, and because of the shear stress distribution, because of the friction and viscosity, a drag force is there, and collectively we have lift force and drag force acted on the body. And if you want to design an efficient car or efficient plane or efficient ship, you have to understand this lift force and drag force all together. To calculate this lift force and drag force, there are coefficients known as lift coefficient and drag coefficient. The values are standard, they are normally given in the book, and then you can calculate your lift force and drag force. So that's your lift force and drag force. Then we learn uh, a few, then we did some few basic experiments to understand how the flow over immerse bodies progress. So, here we have apply we have a plate and then we try to understand this plate in the wind tunnel and then flow over that plate. <coughs> so here it will create this kind of velocity profile at very high Reynolds number, at, at very low Reynolds number, very low velocity, then it will create this kind of velocity profile at higher Reynolds number and then this will create this kind of velocity profile at very high velocity. So this is your boundary layer there. If you change the object, it will look something like this. So very low Reynolds number, it will get nice and smooth flow. Very high, higher Reynolds number, it will get this kind of flow. And then at very high Reynolds number, you are going to get turbulence here. 
<coughs> then we learn about Magnus effect. Magnus effect, if you have a combination of a sphere which is moving along the same line and at the same time it's rotating, that's the case. Then what's going to happen is that your object is going to create generate a lift or it's going to divert from its path. It's going to curve. And if you want to curve, the object is moving, it's also rotating, you are going to get curved path. And then we have seen some videos about this curved object. So that's your Magnus effect given by this guy Henry Magnus sometime uh, in lay sometime in mid 1880s or so. So that's your Magnus effect combination of rotation uh, straight motion plus rotational motion, and then you are going to curve the object or we get curved path for the object. And then finally we learn about this golf ball dynamics. If a golf ball, if it is a smooth sphere, boundary layer separation hypocrisy here, you will get thick wing, lots of drag. If you have dimples on the golf ball, in that case, you will get separation here and then you will get thin wing here. So, if it is used ball, if it is a dimple, golf ball with dimple, this is going to travel a lot faster. If it is brand new smooth sphere, it's going to travel a lot slower because high drag. This one has a lower drag because of the dimple, because of the change in boundary layer separation. It's very easy, it's not that difficult to understand. And that's what we did in chapter 9. Then in chapter 10, open channel flow. So open channel flow is a flow of a fluid or a liquids in this case under atmospheric conditions. So at any given point, you have atmospheric conditions. Let's say rainwater is flowing on the surface. That's your open channel flow, basically. So open channel flow, there are three types of classification for open channel flow, something known as type 1 classification, type 2 classification, and type 3 classification. Type 1 classification is simple. It's based on the depth of the fluid. If depth of the fluid doesn't change, you call it uniform flow. If it does change, you call it non-uniform flow. It's simple. Uniform, non-uniform, based on depth of the fluid. Then type 2 classification. Type 2 classification is based on Reynolds number. In this case, for open channel flow, if Reynolds number is less than 500, call it a laminar flow, it's very rare. If Reynolds number is more than 12,500, call it a turbulent flow. That's your Reynolds number calculated by rho v r h mu. Hydraulic radius, you have to calculate hydraulic radius is given by area by weighted perimeter. Keep that in mind, area divided by wetted perimeter, so whatever the area of cross section by wet part, that will be RH, once you have RH, you can calculate Reynolds number. But the most important classification is type 3 classification based on whether flow is critical, based to subcritical or supercritical, based on fluid number. If fluid number is less than 1, call it a subcritical flow. If it is more than 1, call it supercritical flow. If it is exactly equal to 1, call it a critical flow. So that's type 3 classification. So most of the time when you deal with open channel flow, you have to understand fruit number and then this is the classification It's largely used for open channel flow. Now if you want to know the velocity and uh, if you want to know the velocity and flow rate of any open channel flow, you have to use this equation. There are two kinds of equation. One is known as Shay's equation and another is uh, Manning equation. Shay's equation, you use that and you can calculate velocity for open channel flow. So this one is open channel flow. You get, you have this Shay's coefficient here, proportional to square root of hydraulic radius and slope of the space. So whatever this RH value, RH is nothing but area by weighted perimeter, and a slope of an object, you put these values and you can calculate velocity. Once you have velocity, you can calculate flow rate. That's your Shay's equation. Then there is a modification to that equation known as Manning's equation. Manning said that replace this RH as two third root instead of having one half stay one two third root and then you will get this equation here V is equal to RH two by two by three SO one by two by N and then he added his own coefficient N and then value for the N is given like this here in the table. So based on your concrete steel based on the material you can use the value of N here and then you can calculate velocity. So in the class we did a problem. In this problem what we have is this kind of a canal or channel and then here we want to know what is the velocity, what is the flow rate and what is the fluid number for the flow. So we use this equation, Manning's equation V R H by 2 3 is low and now here uh, 
only thing you slope is given and you can find out from the table is 0 0.012 you have to find out rh hydraulic radius that hydraulic radius is nothing but area by weighted perimeter it means the area of cross section of this thing divided by the weighted perimeter weight part this is the weight part this is the weight part this is the weight part so this length plus this length 4 meters plus this length that will be my weighted perimeter and the area of cross section so total area is my area divided by weighted perimeter i'll get rh once i have rh i can calculate velocity i can calculate flow rate i can calculate food number now to calculate this rh you have to go through the geometry and trigonometry if you are good at geometry and trigonometry this will be very easy calculate the area of this section then calculate this length this length this length the angle is given based on the trigonometry calculate the angle uh, calculate the length here so this length plus this length plus this length add that length and then you will get value for rh that rh value is 1.01 meter do not read this problem solve it take pen and paper take it and then solve this problem if you read these problems you are going to make mistakes in the exam so do not read this problem once you have rh hydraulic radius calculate velocity once you have velocity you can get flow rate and then you can calculate whether flow is critical sub critical you can calculate fluid number it's very easy again do not read this problem solve this problem make sure you know your way to draw with geometry and trigonometry make sure that you know how to calculate this hydraulic radius if you don't know how to calculate hydraulic radius that's a problem then Uh, we learn about hydraulic jump so what happens is that if you have water at very low depth and very high velocity in that case water will try to balance itself it means the water is going to jump water will try to get lower velocity and higher depth so we have super critical water here is going to jump then we have <coughs> sub critical water here so here we have very low velocity higher depth and this phenomenon is known as hydraulic jump here what happens in this jump is you lose energy so you have this energy line here that we learn in chapter 3 in general this energy line should stay constant but as you are going to lose some energy you are going to lose some head loss some head here and then that's change in energy or just the total loss and then if you are designing some large structures you need to know what is this head loss is so here you go you are going to lose some energy and then you are going you are going to reach at subcritical flow and then if you want to predict this height here this height is predicted by using this formula so y2 by y1 is equal to 1/2 -1 plus under root 1 plus 8 i pass square so you use this formula and then you will get total height after the jump then you can calculate head loss once you know height you can calculate head loss by using this formula so all you need to know now is that what is the height here what is the height here and then how much head how much energy that you are losing throughout the flow you can use this one then try to find out and that's your hydraulic jump and that's what we did in chapter 10 then in chapter 12 we learn about turbo machines turbo machines are fluid machines any machine which is operated by fluid or which operates fluid known as fluid machines there are two kinds of fluid machines one is positive displacement machine your reciprocating pump is a positive displacement fluid machine and turbo machine your hydraulic pump your turbine a water turbine a wind turbine these are turbo machines they have some kind of rotary device rotating it around its own axis so that's rotor dynamic machines or turbo machines so this is a chapter about turbo machines there are two kinds of turbo machines either it will be a turbine or it will be a pump canal compressor it means that you are going to extract the energy like a wind energy or like a water turbine uh, wind turbine water turbine or steam turbine you extract the energy from the fluid that's called turbine if you give energy supply energy to a device and then you increase the pressure of the fluid like a pump fan compressor that's going to be pump fan compressor so that's a general classification between turbine and pump fan compressor we learned some examples uh, in the in the, in this class So this one we learn steam turbines and then we learn about gas turbines. So this is the example for a gas turbine. What happens is this gas turbine is that you have air goes into this gas turbine. And this is a compressor. It's going to compress that air. Once it compresses, the temperature pressure increases of that air and goes into combustion chamber. In combustion chamber, something that happens in your car: you spray fuel and you ignite the fuel. Once you ignite the fuel, already it is compressed. it's going to increase the temperature and pressure further 
and then that high change, that change in increase uh, in temperature and pressure, because of that, it's going to go through this turbine and it's going to rotate that turbine. So this one is your gas turbine rotated from this highly combusted gas, and then as it rotates, it's going to convert that chemical energy of the chemical energy of the fuel into mechanical energy. Some of that mechanical energy goes back to the compressor. And then the other part of the energy, you can attach a turbine, uh, attach a generator here, you can generate electricity. Or you can attach a large blade, and then you can use it as a jet engine. So that's your gas turbine. Then some other turbine, uh, wind turbine known as horizontal axis wind turbine and vertical axis wind turbine. So the axis of rotation is horizontal par parallel to the ground. So that's your horizontal axis and then you have vertical axis wind turbine. The idea is same, extract the energy from the wind. Then we learn some examples about water turbine. One of the water turbine example is Kaplan turbine. So Kaplan turbine is axial flow machine. It means that if you have water available at very large quantity but very low head, in that case what you do is you install this turbine, the water will fall through on this blade, it's going to rotate the blade, you are going to generate the energy. And that's your Kaplan turbine. Then Pelton turbine or Pelton beam. If the water is stored somewhere large in the mountain, then that has large potential energy. You take that water down and then convert that potential energy to kinetic energy. That kinetic energy falls on these buckets. It's rotate the buckets, convert it into mechanical energy. Then you can convert that mechanical energy to electricity. So that's your Pelton turbine or Pelton wheel. And then it has these large buckets to convert that kinetic energy into mechanical energy. And then widely used is Francis turbine. If you are been to the Hoover Dam, Nevada, they use or they employ this kind of Francis turbine. So Francis turbine, the flow enters radially, exits axially, it's going to rotate the blade, and then as it rotates, it's going, you can generate that energy, you can take out, uh, convert that mechanical energy into electric, electrical energy. So that's your Francis turbine, widely used devices, and there are some videos of turbine you can find out on the blackboard. Then pump, fan and compressor, these are the things where opposite of turbine, you supply the energy and then they will increase the pressure of the fluid. So centrifugal pump, because of the centrifugal action, the low pressure created at the section, suction part and then is going to send the water at desired height. Centrifugal fan is similar to centrifugal pump, but only in case it works with air instead of water. Then centrifugal compressor, again for air, but instead of just sending air, it's going to compress that air. It's going to increase the pressure of that air. And that's your centrifugal compressor. If you have smaller jet engine, most likely, we'll employ a centrifugal compressor to compress the fluid or compress the air. Then cavitation. This is very important. Cavitation, what happens is that blade starts rotating at very high speed. And as soon as it rotates at very high speed, the pressure along the blade decreases. And then sometimes, let's say this thing is inside water, rotating at very high speed, and as pressure decreases, Sometimes the pressure goes below vapor pressure of the liquid or water. We all know that water can boil at very low pressure. So velocity goes up, pressure goes down. Pressure goes so down that it goes below vapor pressure of water and then water will begin to boil. It means the steam bubbles formed along the edge of these kind of blades. And as soon as these steam bubble form, it's not just one or two bubbles, it's like thousands of bubbles per minute or so. So as soon as this steam bubble form, they get out of the surface and as soon as they get out, get out, the pressure becomes normal and then they burst. So they burst, they create a shock wave. So it's not just one bubble, but thousands of bubbles bursting at the same time. Shock wave is very large and that shock wave damages the blade. And if that damage, you can see the damage. So this is a pump, brand new pump, supposed to work for 10 years or so. Within two years, the pump will become completely useless. You have to replace it. This one is a Francis turbine. This one is that's the effect of cavitation. You are going to lose your efficiency. You're going to damage the blade. Sound, you're going to get have very unpleasant sound. And that's your change. Uh, that's the cavitation. So you have to do everything possible to avoid cavitation. The cavitation is there. And you have to replace the device very early. And that will be huge financial cost for you. So you don't want that loss for you. And therefore, you have to design it for without cavitation or you have to make sure that conditions are there where there is no cavitation. And to, for that, there is something known as net positive suction head. If you are using a pump, hydraulic pump, which is the most commonly used device, the condition is that net positive suction head 
should be always the available suction head should be always higher or equal to net positive suction head required. So that's the condition. So what in this condition we have is that NPSHR required net positive suction head is given by the manufacturer. It's like 15 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters is given by the manufacturer. Then based on that number, you have to calculate your required, your available head. You have to account atmospheric pressure. You have to account height at which you are going to place. You have to talk about head loss and vapor pressure of the fluid. All these things you have to account and then you have to see whether NPSHA is higher than NPSHR. So NPSHR is 15 meter. You have to make sure that NPSHA is higher than 15 or higher. It means it should be 16, 17, 18. If it goes below that, if NPSHR is 15 meter, if NPSHA goes below that, if it is 3 meters, 4, if it is 12, 13 meters, then cavitation will occur and then your pump will become useless. So you have to follow this condition. You have to use this equation and calculate NPSHA and then you will not have cavitation and that's pretty much we have in this chapter chapter 12. Now this turbo machine chapter uh, if in your final year if you take the class turbo machinery you will learn more about pump fan and compressor and turbine. For now we just covered some basic things about these turbo machines or fluid machines. And then the final chapter fluid kinematics that's chapter 4. We know that fluid dynamics is study of fluids on the motion. So what we do here is we also consider forces in fluid in motion. But sometimes we are not worried about forces. Sometimes I only want to know velocity and acceleration of the fluid. If that's the case, we call it fluid kinematics. So fluid kinematics is study of fluids in motion without considering forces. Only consider velocity, only consider acceleration. Don't consider forces. If that's the case, that's your fluid kinematics. So fluid kinematics is nothing but kinematics of the fluid. We have a particle moving from point A to point B to point C. And then that particle has three motions, x velocity, y velocity, z velocity, three acceleration, x acceleration, y acceleration, z acceleration. You calculate all those velocities, you calculate all those acceleration. That's simply your fluid kinematics. So to calculate the velocity, let's say I have a particle here is going to follow this path and at this point it has some velocity, it has some acceleration. If I want to know that, I'm going to use this kind of equation. So this one, this particle, this velocity at this point is function of four dimensions, three dimensional space, one is time. So velocity is function of x, y, z and t and this v is further divided into three parts, x velocity, y velocity and z velocity. So I can write down that u x, y, z, d, v, and j, w. So u, v, w are the velocities in x, y, z directions respectively and i, j, k are unit vectors for those directions. So I can write down as v is equal to u, i plus v, j plus w, k and that will be my equation for velocity. If I want to solve this equation, if I want to the magnitude of the velocity, I put this equation u square plus w square plus u square plus v square plus w square and that will get me speed or the magnitude of that velocity at that point. If I want to know acceleration, I'm going to simply differentiate this equation with respect to time, then I'll get acceleration. So there are two methods, Eilerian method and Lagrangian method, to find out what kind of what, what this fluid, uh, do, do this find out velocities on acceleration of the fluid. So Eilerian method is something that fix the coordinate system and try to analyze what happens with the flow. Lagrangian method in which we tag the particle, it means that coordinate system move with particle and if that's the case that's Lagrangian method. Based on application we use either Eilerian method or Lagrangian method to understand velocity and acceleration and overall dynamics of that fluid. Then uh, if there is a one dimension, two dimension, three dimensional flow, if you are studying something very complex, you may have to choose a three dimensional equation for the flow. If you are using something very simple, then you may have to choose one direction, one dimension equation for the flow. So here in this case, you want to study meandering of a river. It means that you want to know what exact path the river is going to take. Is that case, then you have to study all three dimensions of the fluid, of the flow. But if you just want to know velocity and acceleration at any given point, velocity here, velocity here, velocity here. In that case, you may choose to study with 1D flow or one dimension. Then steady flow and unsteady flow. If the flow, uh, the velocity 
of the flow does not change, if the pressure density does not change with time, that's your steady flow. If they change in time, that's your unsteady flow. So if it is steady flow, take this zero, dv by dt, d, d rho by dt, take this zero. If it is no unsteady flow, if it is a non-zero, you have to solve for it, you have to calculate for it. Then we learn about velocity and acceleration at any given point. So for velocity and acceleration, this one is the equation for the velocity that we have seen before. V is equal to ui plus vj plus wk. And then you are going to get three kinds of acceleration. It means that you this you have to find out what is this du by dt, acceleration in x direction. It nothing but differentiation of this u by dt. This u is function of x, y, z, and t. Therefore, you have to apply chain rule and then you will get this kind of answers for ax, ay, az and these are the acceleration of x, y and z direction. If you solve these things, you should get the ax, ay and az and then you can find out the magnitude of that acceleration. So this one is for any flow. If it is a steady flow, in that case you can use this equation to calculate ax, ay and az and once you have that, these acceleration in all directions, you can use this equation acceleration as ax square plus ay square plus az square and collectively you can find out what is the magnitude of that acceleration. So we did one problem in the class, in this problem what we have, now again do not read these problems, if you read these problems you are going to make mistakes. So you have to make sure that you will not read these problems and you have to you take pen and paper and you solve this problem. So in this kind of problem the equation for the velocity profile is given, so there is some object and it has some velocity. This one is 4x square i, 10x minus 10 square yj, and my plus 2 theta. That's the equation. Based on that equation, I want to know what is the acceleration, what is the velocity at this point. So this particle is moving and it reaches at this point 2, 1, 3 in Cartesian coordinate system at what t is equal to 1. Once it reaches at that point, I want to know what is the velocity. The particle will continue, but at that instant, at that point, I want to know velocity, I want to know acceleration. We start with velocity, we, coordinate, we correlate this coefficient. So 4x square cube i, this is nothing but u. Minus 10x square y is nothing but v. 2t is nothing but w. So we correlate or correlate this equation with the regular equation of i, j, and k. And if that if you do, if you do that, we'll get a value of u v, w, that's velocity in x, y, and z direction. Then all you have to do is apply x is equal to 2 in this case, y is equal to 1, then z is equal to 3. Apply those numbers there, t is equal to 1. And then if you apply that, you will get the velocities u, v, w direction. It's very simple. Once you have those velocities, you can use this equation to calculate the magnitude of the velocity. Velocity calculation is very simple. You don't have to worry much about it. It's all you have to do is that correlate u v w and then calculate the velocity. Then acceleration. So here, for that acceleration, you have to use this equation. For that, so now you have value of u already. So value of u you have calculated here, 32 meter per second or 32 units. You have to find out what is this dou u by dou x. It means that u is 4x cube. You have to differentiate it with x. It's a simple differentiation, but still, as you have to do a lot of them, it becomes complicated slightly. So here, 4x cube differentiation is nothing but 12x squared. So you have to differentiate this one into x. Then later, with y, there is no y there, so it's going to become 0. So all you have to do is get these values for each and every entity here, like this. And once you have these values, you can take these values, plug it back into the equation, once you plug it back into the equation, you can solve it for x equal to 1 to y is equal to 2, z is equal to 3. And once you solve it, you, you can get your acceleration. So here, you solve these things. And once you solve it, you'll get final number for the acceleration. So you'll get the values of ax, ay, and az. You get these values. You put this equation, ax square plus ay square plus az square. And then you can solve it for final acceleration. Do not read these problems. Take pen and paper and solve them. Make sure you understand them. If you need these problems, you are going to make silly mistakes in the exam. Then finally, we learn about vortex flow. So vortex flow in this chapter, <coughs> you take your cup of coffee, you start rotating with the spoon, you are going to get this kind of vortex. So there are two kinds of vortex. One is free vortex and another is force vortex. So force vortex, if you apply external torque, it is your force vortex. 
if you don't apply trot, but if you have a hole at the bottom of the glass, then your fluid liquid is going to go down and that's your free voltage, no external torque is required. Either way, so this depth for that voltage is depend on velocity. So higher the velocity, more the depth. So if you want to calculate this depth, you use this kind of formula. Z is equal to omega square, R square by 2G. So omega square is your velocity in radians per second. R square is the radius by 2G. You do that and then you can get depth. So there is a problem in the uh, slides you have. You have to find out this is the thing that rotating. This is a container rotating at 300 RPM. You want to know depth. So this is given in RPM. Omega should be in radian per second. So you have to use this equation, convert it into radian per second. So 2 pi to 300 by 60 radian per second. You use that radian per second value here in this equation and you can calculate the depth, this depth. And that will be around 50 centimeter or 0.5 meter. That's the depth you get. That's the final answer. It's very simple, but you have to make sure that omega in radian per second, and then you have to make sure that uh, your r is in meters because gravity as in meters in it, so R should be in meters. So here in this case R is 10 centimeter, it means that you have to make sure that, that R is 0.1 meter. So here in this case, we did it in centimeter, but make sure that you're consistent with the units. So if everything is in meter, you should get depth as 0.5 meter or 50 centimeter, either way is fine. So that was the review of all chapters. So these are the chapters that we covered in the fluid mechanics. So we start with fluid introduction with fluid mechanics. Introduction of fluid mechanics is general idea what fluid mechanics is from basic definitions. Then fluid statics is the study of fluids at rest and we learn Pascal's principle. We learn rho g at study of the fluid pressure in the fluid at the bottom. Then we learn about Bernoulli's equation in chapter 3. Very important equation part of fluid dynamics. Then fluid kinematics we learn how to calculate velocity and acceleration of a fluid with the equation. Then dimensional analysis, we learn Buckingham Pi theorem and how to use this Pi term to simulate the model and to simulate an experiment for the model and the prototype. Then discuss flow in pipes, we learn about head loss, major loss and minor loss and we learn Moody chart, flow over embers bodies, we learn about lip force and drag force, open channel flow, we learn about hydraulic jump, we learn about Shazy and Manning equation and then we learn classification of critical, subcritical, supercritical flow. And then finally, in turbo machines, we learn turbines, compressor, and pump. Some basic idea about these devices. So these are the chapters. They will be there for your final exam. <laughs> Make sure that you study these chapters, and then it will be easier for you in your final exam. Now, I'm going to extend the project deadline. So if you're watching this before 30th of November, that will be the Monday 30th of November. That will be your project deadline. So that's the final deadline for the project. When you study for all these things, try to study for concept, don't study for just for grades. I mean, if you have understand the concept, the grades will follow. Also, try to correlate this chapter with one another because all these fluid mechanics concept, they are related to each other. It's not like one chapter is different than another chapter. Everything is related and it's connected. So try to look at them collectively and that will create very specific neural connections in your mind and those neural connections will help you in long run to become a better engineer or be to better uh, to learn how to have better understanding of fluid mechanics to learn them together and try to make them those connections and try to connect the dots so that's what our mean 3311 fluid mechanics and then that was the final review if you have any questions or comments send me an email and then i'll respond accordingly so that's all for today i wish you all the best for your final exam good luck take care and stay safe thank you